Jay Wendley claims moon rocks contain no water and have no evidence of the presence of water in their formation. Do you agree? Or do you go by this other statement from Windley? As a matter of raw observation, lunar samples have always shown a barely detectable amount of water. Let me give you an illustration. If someone were to ask you what are some of the major differences between the Earth and the Moon, wouldn't one of your answers probably be that the Earth has an atmosphere and the Moon doesn't? But technically the Moon does have an atmosphere. It's just extremely rarefied and would not really be necessary to mention in the context of that question. Then at some later time you're discussing this nearly non-existent atmosphere and what its composition is and someone comes along and goes, Ooh, ooh, you're contradicting yourself. You're a liar. I'm going to tell the world. This all proves that we never went to the moon. I'm going to expose you for the fraud that you are. Over and 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 over. Unlike you, I have no need to quote I have no need to quote mine, quote mine, quote mine. Oh, please. There is no comparison between the atmospheres of the Earth and Moon and the water contents of Earth rocks and Apollo samples. Let me give you an illustration. To measure density, we measure in atoms per cubic centimetre. In other words, how many atoms of any said element are packed into each cubic centimetre of space? The lunar atmosphere consists mostly of argon and helium and has a density of 80,000 atoms per cubic centimetre meaning every cubic centimetre has 80,000 of these argon and helium atoms squashed into it. 80,000 atoms may sound like a lot, but in terms of atmospheric pressure it only works out to be 0 psi, making it virtually non-existent. At sea level, the Earth's atmosphere has a density of 10 to the 19 atoms per cubic centimetre. For those who don't understand scientific notation, that's a 1 followed by 19 zeros. Yeah, that's a lot of atoms. Now for the water in the Earth rocks and Apollo rocks. For those keeping score, the rocks and soil that Friedman studied contain 455 parts per million and 810 parts per million respectively. And I must emphasize, Friedman assured us that these numbers are comparable to that of terrestrial basalts. Now at the time Astro Brandt released his video, the confirmed amount of water in the spherules was still only 46 parts per million. But Sal's estimates for the actual contents of water were between 260 parts per million and 745 parts per million. Which incidentally is also comparable to that of volcanic glasses found on Earth. And finally, the rocks that Argyle studied contain water as high as 1,000 parts per million to 1,500 parts per million. Hardly a rarefied amount. They are by all means comparable to the 150 parts per million to 10,000 parts per million for terrestrial rocks. And as you'll see later on, more recent studies have shown even higher water contents in NASA's samples. In simplicity, the Earth rocks and Apollo samples have exactly the same water concentrations. The Earth and Moon do not have the same atmospheric densities. So, Duck Boy, which claim by Windley do you stick with? His claim that Moon rocks have no water and contain no evidence of the presence of water in their formation? Or his claim that Moon rocks have always shown a so-called barely detectable amount of water? Until you answer this properly, I'll be adding this to your list of questions you dodged. It should also be pointed out that Agrel and his team ruled out the possibility that the water they found could have been introduced through contamination, because the samples, according to NASA's official story, were supposedly never exposed to the Earth's atmosphere long enough to acquire this water. The almost constant value of H2O is significant. It must be held in the glass in what appear to be original water, since the samples have never been subjected to a damp atmosphere for any significant length of time. Friedman's team also doubt that the water they found could have been from contamination. But even though their 1970 paper explicitly states that 
contamination by earth water is thought to be low. Throughout his video, Webb peddles the same old excuse that NASA and propagandists have used whenever pressed on this substantially high amount of water. Oh, it's just contamination from the water here on the Earth. Third, Dr. Mark Norman's statement in the 2001 NASA article, The Great Moon Hoax, that lunar samples have almost no water trapped in their crystal structure does not blow the whistle on any NASA cover-up. All you need to do is look back to when the moon rocks first arrived on Earth. From the very beginning, scientists had detected trace water in the moon rocks brought back by the Apollo astronauts. But... Since those rocks contain no mica, clay minerals, or hydrous iron oxides, minerals that would be present if water had actually played a part in their formation, it was assumed that the trace water was contamination that had leaked into the containers used to house the moon rocks during their long trip from the moon to Houston. Some scientists, like Dr. Norman, mention this trace water, while other scientists dismiss it because other indicators suggested it was not of lunar origin. There are several problems with this statement. Firstly, why in the world would Webb claim that the Apollo samples contain no clay minerals when in fact one of the four most common minerals found in them is ilmenite, an opaque clay mineral? Secondly, it is not true that the Apollo samples do not contain hydrous minerals. In fact, Taylor, Mao and Bell presented a report on this at the 4th Lunar Science Conference in 1973. Their report was amusingly titled, Apollo 16 Rusty Rock 66095. But would you believe it? These hydrated minerals were also attributed to terrestrial contamination. Oxidation and hydrous mineral phases occurring in lunar rocks may have different origins. Agrel and his team first reported the presence of goethite in some Apollo 14 breccias. More recently, Williams and Gibson have discussed several possible geneses for this phase. The occurrences of oxidized and hydrated phases in many Apollo 16 rocks, particularly from Station 6, are numerous, and it has been possible to obtain a reasonable explanation of the process which formed these products. In this short paper, we examine observations and microphobe data which led us to believe that the oxidized phases in the Apollo 16 rusty rocks are the indirect result of extra and post-lunar contamination. A portion of this study was presented previously by Taylor, Mao, and Bell. Rock 66095 is a partly melted breccia, consisting of about 50% plagioclase, 35% olivine, 3% opaques, and 10 to 15% relict clasts that are troctolictic. Sample 660911 contains native iron nickel metal grains, mainly as clusters up to 1 to 2 millimeters across, with the intervening areas containing little or no native metal. The regions in and around the metal grains are highly fractured, and the majority of the metal, and some troilite, has been oxidized to various degrees, commonly containing rims of goethite and probable hematite and magnetite, all of which form a prevailing red-brown stain. This stain has migrated for considerable distances along the numerous cracks. The most plausible explanation now is that the hydration and oxidation occurred on Earth, or during the return to Earth aboard the Apollo 16 spacecraft. Another geologist called Taylor, in league with a Samuel Epstein, also reported on finding hydrous iron oxides in the rusty rock. They studied its ratios of deuterium to hydrogen and oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 and released a paper on it in 1974 during the 5th Lunar Science Conference. They identified another hydrous mineral in sample 66095, Akaganeite. But as with the other Taylor and his team, these two geologists also concluded that these hydrous minerals were the result of terrestrial contamination. Stepwise vacuum extractions of H2O at temperatures ranging from 25 degrees Celsius to 700 degrees Celsius were carried out on lunar rusty rock 66095. This rock contains larger amounts of H2O than any other lunar rock or soil yet analyzed. About 20% of the evolved water is liberated at 25 degrees Celsius, and nearly all of the water is removed by the time the rock is heated to 200 degrees Celsius. 
Thus, the H2O in 66095 is even more loosely bound than the absorbed H2O in lunar soils, which ordinarily do not undergo significant dehydration below 200 to 300 degrees Celsius. The average deuterium and oxygen-18 values of H2O evolved from 66095 are about negative 100 per mil and negative 15 per mil respectively. These values are remarkably similar to those in terrestrial atmospheric water vapor. The stepwise isotopic release patterns for 66095 show no appreciable variation in either deuterium or oxygen-18, indicating that there is only one major type of H2O present in this sample. Similar stepwise heating experiments were also carried out on samples of rehydrated 66095 and on two forms of ferric oxide hydroxide, a terrestrial goethite and a synthetic acagonite. Except for the oxygen-18 values in the synthetic acagonite, the amounts of isotopic compositions of H2O obtained by stepwise heating of all these samples are practically identical to that obtained for 66095. The abnormally heavy oxygen-18 value of the acagonite probably can be accounted for by non-equilibrium evaporation of H2O from the water-rich acagonite. The similarity in H2O release patterns and isotopic compositions between 66095 and the terrestrial samples formed from meteoric waters indicates that H2O extracted from 66095 is a terrestrial contaminant. What the hell is going on here? A minute ago, the lack of hydrous minerals was the telltale sign of terrestrial contamination. Now the presence of hydrous minerals in the Apollo samples is also the result of contamination. Which is it? Still, that is not to say that all geologists are convinced that these hydrous minerals are the result of contamination. Friedman and his team also reported on these hydrous minerals. Yep, the same guys who wrote that fascinating report that Webb cited. I think that demonstrates just how vast his knowledge of his own sources is. In their 1974 science article, Friedman and his team do not rule out the possibility of contamination, but they do consider it the least likely cause. Lunar Rock 66095 contains a hydrated iron oxide and has an unusual amount of water for a lunar rock, 140 to 750 parts per million. Although it is possible that most of the water in the iron oxide, goethite, may be terrestrial in the origin, or may have exchanged with terrestrial water during sample return and handling. Evidence presented herein suggests that this did not happen, and that some lunar water may have a deuterium that is indistinguishable from that of terrestrial water. Lunar Rock 66095 exhibits rusty appearing streaks, which may have been identified as goethite, a hydrated iron oxide. Agrell and his team have noticed the occurrence of small amounts of goethite in Apollo 14 breccias 14301 and 14307. However, in contrast to the Apollo samples, the goethite in sample 66095 is abundant enough to give the visual impression of rusty streaks in the rock. Although the evidence appears strong that the rusty streaks were present when the sample boxes were opened at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory in Houston, we cannot be sure that the original rusty color was due to goethite. It is possible that the reddish-brown color was due to an unhydrated iron oxide, which then hydrated during sample processing. The samples were handled in glove boxes under a dry nitrogen atmosphere, but the total exclusion of water vapor cannot be assured. The question of the lunar origin of goethite is important, since it would imply the existence of larger amounts of water, at least on isolated parts of the moon, than has been shown from the analysis of lunar materials returned from earlier missions. Williams and Gibson have discussed the stability of goethite and conclude that it could be produced as the result of normal low-temperature processes indigenous to the moon. As part of their studies, Friedman and company compared the rust of sample 66095 with a sample of rust they'd chipped off from an old rusty automobile. I kid you not. And samples of rust from two iron meteorites, one found in Australia and the other in Texas. They noticed that the values of deuterium were the same between the water from sample 66095 and the water in the terrestrial rust. Now, the oxygen-18 in the latter apparently varies, but in Friedman's observations, they found it was depleted by comparison with water from 66095's rust. 
This led Friedman to conclude that the rust and water was of lunar origin, not terrestrial contamination.